Jamaica Society for the Blind commemorated Sight Awareness Week 2019 from May 12 to May 18. One of the highlights, an enthralling lecture given by none other than Senator Dr. Floyd Morris. The theme was Understanding Blindness, Making a Difference. Let's join him now and have a listen. Now, the point of the matter is that a lot of individuals, you know, tend to ignore the problem of their sight in its early, in its embryonic stages until it becomes a major problem, then they seek uh, support. And the issue is that we as individuals, we have to take responsibility for our individual health. I can't take care of Damien's health and Damien cannot take care of my health. In other words, there's a Jamaican saying that goes, he who feels it knows it. So the person who is experiencing the visual problem must ensure that he or she seeks assistance as early as possible so that they can put in place the necessary corrective measures. And there are in the Jamaican space a number of organizations that provide some form of service to persons who have visual problems. Stop. But we do the major institution that caters to persons who are blind and visually impaired in Jamaica is the Jamaica Society for the Blind. And the Jamaica Society for the Blind has been doing so for years. In most cases, free of cost to the public. I must indicate here that it is through the work of the Jamaica Society for the Blind that I was able to rehabilitate myself and be reintegrated, so to speak, in the mainstream of society. But I want to point out before I venture into, into that, because the theme that we are speaking to today is understanding blindness making a difference. And I want to point out some concerns that I have in the Jamaican society as it relates to the development of visual problems, especially within the context of our educational system. It is my view that a lot of the problems we are experiencing in the educational system is because we have children with different types of disabilities and there is not an understanding or appreciation as to how to treat with and deal with these situations. So you have individuals who have intellectual disabilities, but they are treated as quote unquote dunce in the system because they are performing below their capacity. You have individuals who have visual impairment. And because of the visual challenges, they are unable to see what is being written on the blackboard by their teachers. And that impacts on 
their performance in the school system. And a lot of the school system, the schools rather, do not have the network in terms of relating to organizations that have the capacity to assist them in putting in place measures that can assist students with these different types of disabilities. And here we are focusing primarily on blindness and visual disability within this context. In rural areas, the problems are more significant than in urban areas because in the urban areas, you, especially in the Kingston metropolitan area, you have the Salvation Army School for the Blind and you have the Jamaica Society for the Blind that are available to those schools in the metropolis to assist. But as you go into rural Jamaica, these educational institutions are not privileged to the services of an organization, for example, the Jamaica Society for the Blind. I am aware that the organization goes out from time to time to uh, have public seminars in these institutions but it's not on an intense basis where you are able to penetrate the over 1,000 primary and high schools in the system. So you have a serious challenge and I can speak to it Fulsomely because in 1983 I developed glaucoma. At the time we never knew what it was. I went to school after the summer holidays and found out that my normal position in the classroom at the back is not now I give trouble myself and wonder. But sat at the back of the class and noticed that I couldn't see the back blackboard clearly. And even when I went to the front of the class, there were still problems. And the teachers then never understand or knew what to do because this was a strange occurrence for them. They never knew where to turn to. I was referred to the optometrist at the time and went and did checks on my eyes and glasses were prescribed and I was subsequently recommended to the university hospital uh, for um, further examination and it was at the university hospital that they detected that I had glaucoma now, at that time, at age 14, the doctors said that it was the first they saw a teenager with glaucoma in Jamaica. And they immediately went to work and prescribed a number of treatments and surgery, ultimately after the medication were not controlling the pressure in their eye. And so, the sight deteriorated, continued to deteriorate, and the, the grades continued to plummet. Whilst I was in high school. Now, if the institution was aware at the time of the Jamaica Society for the Blind. It is possible that some corrective measures or supportive measures could have been put in place to ensure that I would 
be able to go through the education system and get my formal education but instead I just wandered through the system went and did my CXC exams failed all of them and, and left the high school because I was unable to graduate but lo and behold I learned of Jamaica Society for the Blind and thanks to Doreen Samuels of blessed memory because it was during a sight awareness week that I learned of the Jamaica Society for the Blind and what the organization is capable of doing and I after mobilizing funds set sail to Kingston went to the Jamaica Society for the Blind learned to read and write braille and my braille tutor is here Mr. Henry Clausen and I, he will tell you that I learned braille in five weeks at the Jamaica Society for the Blind and I was now on my way to Michael Evening College to do my well I did GCE O and A levels and within a two year period I was able to complete those subjects and moved on to the University of the West Indies now at the University of the West Indies it was a transformative moment for me uh, again I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces that are part of the journey because Mr. Sullivan was the uh, warden at the time then it morphed into student services manager and I really came into national prominence whilst I was on Taylor Hall because it was there that I became the first person with a visual disability to have been elected on the Guild Council and also elected as Deputy Hall Chairman for Taylor Hall and Mr. Sullivan will tell you that the next year they voted me out as a uh, hall chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my involvement in student politics on the campus really set the stage for uh, national responsibilities and I I'm taking the time out to mention all of this to you because it is important for us to understand why it is that we have to make a difference as persons who are blind slash persons who have a visual disability and have succeeded because there is tremendous work that needs to be done out there on behalf of the population of persons with disabilities and more so persons with visual disabilities there are stigma associated with being blind people believe that if you are a blind man or a blind woman automatically you are a beggar so you might be going about your legitimate business and you hear somebody say this is all that I have to give you today once they see the white people or some of them will be pertinent enough to tell you that look I don't have anything to give and you don't stretch out your hand begging anything 
but because of the perceptions that are there as it relates to persons who are blind they adopt that sort of behavior and attitude towards a person with disability they believe that as a blind person we can't work or if we work it must be on a menial basis there are some who believe that as person persons who are blind and visually impaired it is the state that must take care of us and so in understanding blindness we have to realize that there are some fundamental societal issues relating to persons who are blind that we must confront. And I have consistently said to whom much is given, much is required. And I have decided that I am going to venture into national politics so that I can sit at the table and assist in guiding and shaping public policy that will make a difference in the lives of persons with disabilities and those of us who are blind and visually impaired. And I must say that we have seen some accomplishment, but we are nowhere near where we are supposed to be. Because the national policy for persons with disabilities was tabled in the parliament in 2000, and I had the uh, privilege of uh, piloting the resolution tabling that um, policy in 2000 and then I became Minister of State in 2001 and led the negotiations for the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities between 2002 and 2007 at the United Nations a document that we subsequently signed and ratified and Jamaica was the first to do so and simultaneously we were working on preparing the Disabilities Act which I sought and got permission from Cabinet in 2004 to draft the Disabilities Act. And it took 10 long years before that act was passed in the Parliament. And it has taken five years before it is being implemented and it is being delayed because the effective date is yet to be set by the Minister of Labor and Social Security and there has to be some regulation and codes of practice to be put in place to bring about that uh, um, effective date from the minister and I am aware that work is proceeding on that but it might be slow it might be too slow so there are some things that are being done to change the society as it relates to persons with disabilities of which those of us who are blind and visually impaired are a part and we who are blind and have visual challenges must ensure that in this Jamaican space we make every effort to demonstrate to individuals that we might be blind but we still have the capacity to function and to perform and participate 
in the productive capacity of our country. And in doing so, those who have received education and training and have excelled in their various spheres must become ambassadors for the population of persons who are blind and visually impaired. One of the things that I take note of, and this is an example of making a difference, I always hear people ascribe this negative perception as to how a blind person looks. So if it is that you dress up and go out, Mr. Sullivan, and you're in a mismatch clothing, they say, oh, you dress so like you're blind. Because people in the society believe that once you're blind, you have to carry yourself in a particular way. And from the moment I have been involved with national life, I said to myself that I am not just a representative for the political organization that I sit in the parliament to represent, but I am an ambassador for persons with disabilities. And so the way how I look, the way how I conduct myself, the way how I present myself, has to be done in a particular way so that individuals realize and understand that as a person who is blind, I am fully capable, we are fully capable of making a meaningful contribution to the society. And that must be the message, and that must be the approach of every single person with a visual disability. You might not be able to purchase a Ralph Lauren suit, you know. You might not be able to buy a Georgia Bottini shoes. But make sure that when you go out there, you put yourself together well, your clothes is well ironed, that your shoes is clean. We say, oh, I hate the dirty shoes. And some people have the gall when your shoes dirty them say, oh, I'm blind. That sort of thing we must reject. We must make sure that we carry ourselves properly because deportment is an important part of the advocacy for persons who are blind and visually impaired. So it is very important for us to understand issues relating to blindness. It is important for us to understand the causes of blindness. But equally, it is important for us to understand some of the negative stigma associated with blindness and how we can counter them in the Jamaican society so that people can have a more positive approach and attitude towards persons who are blind and visually impaired. The Jamaican Society for the Blind has been playing a seminal role in desensitization and they ought to be commended for the work that they have done in light of the limited resources that they have at their disposal. And I want to pledge in whatsoever way I can
to this trying and progressive regime of the organization now. Whatsoever way I can to help the Jamaica Society for the Blind in its advocacy. Because you have made me into who I am. And I have to, in return, I have to, in return, give back to the organization. And I close by saying, we have to understand blindness. We have to understand blindness. And we have to make a difference. And those of us who have managed to break the glass ceiling, so to speak, owe it to our brothers and sisters who are behind us to pave the way so that these individuals can be integrated in the mainstream of the general health society. I thank you. Yes, what a brilliant presentation that was. You agree? And in as much as he opened by saying that he is preaching to the converted, the truth is there is always something else that resonates with you that says, that stirs you into action and that says that look, the work isn't over yet it has just begun and there are others behind us who really and truly we have to pave the way for thank you very much again Senator Morris for really taking time out of the busy schedule to make this event happen and I'm sure that persons here today have reconnected with something or have heard something for the first time that is going to further stir them into action. Okay, are there any questions, any comments? Well, maybe I should start the ball rolling. And my... As the chairman of the organization, Senator Morris, uh, having to look at policy, having to ensure that we work towards getting proper policies in place to, to assist persons, not just in Kingston and St. Andrew, but across Jamaica. Help us to understand uh, the context of I mean, it, it, it's an NGO, it's getting itself out there as it relates to government and farming policies, it's a little bit different. But help us to understand and how to position the organization as it relates to tapping into, into resources that will facilitate executing the policies. Because yes, the policies are there, the policies are being created, but a lot of times the challenge comes with the execution. So, can you just shed some light on that for us, please? One of the things that we have to understand in Jamaica is that the Jamaica Society for the so policy formulation is being driven more so now than before by data and so if you are involved in an advocacy organization which the Jamaica Society for the Blind is and as it, as it is a non-governmental organization for you to impact you have to make sure that your advocacy 
is being guided by research data. And so, if you are going to tap into resources of the state and resources of the multilateral institutions, you have to make sure that you have research data based on uh, the programs, based on the policies that you are implementing so that when you go to the government or the multilateral, you have credible data and your experience or knowledge that you are taking to them to say, hey, you have this policy in place and we want to assist you with the implementation. Based on our research, this is the situation. And we have the experience, we have the team that can implement such and such a project to bring life to the past. So you have to make sure that you are coming to the table with credible research data to back up your experiential knowledge. And this is why it is important for you to build up a database of uh, persons who are blind and visually impaired across Jamaica. Every single individual who comes through the doors of the Jamaica Society for the Blind with a visual problem, uh, you should ensure that you capture the data on those individuals. And you don't have to depend on any sophisticated software to set up a database and not tell people the good old Excel can do it. You know, capturing the names, capturing the address, capturing the um, employment data, capturing uh, the type of uh, visual problem that is there, all of that sort of stuff. So you can use that database in your research agenda and that will help you in terms of uh, advocacy and strengthening your uh, quest for implementation of policies. Well, I'm, I'm sure Miss Harris would be happy to hear that because she has been one of the advocates for that. She's the coordinator of the Vision Center and she has been one of the advocates in terms of data, data, data and uh, the importance of data and uh, yes she has my support in that corner and it's something that we we, we have a system it's not yet it's not as perfect as we like but we are in the we are going in the right direction any questions because i have another one you know okay. but i don't want to look greedy good evening everyone good evening, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. i'm here with um, one of the directors um, on the board of Jamaica Society for the Blind. Yes. And uh, one of the persons that was privileged to sit as that representing NGO or the negotiating um, table at the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And uh, I can tell you, first, a um, person from varying countries, different cultures, they look to Jamaica through St. Maurice. Because if, a, if something was discussed and you didn't have an input, people ask for it. And that means they respect us as a country. And we were the first country to sign and ratify the convention. And we were mandated to have an evaluation of five years. And one five years passed away. And in Jamaica, the first country we have not, our government have not done what they are supposed to do yet and we are looking to the second five years next year. My question is, um, Dr. Morris, what can we do to stir the government to let them know that people are looking to us? 
we in Jamaica are expected to do something because we were the forerunner, so to speak. We were one of the strongest, smallest and strongest boys at the negotiator table. So we are ex the other countries are looking to us. What will our evaluation for the second five years be if we don't take bull by the horn and get government to do something? Thank you. I know you're doing a lot of work, you know, but I mean from the government perspective. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mary. Yes, because Mary was representing the it was the DPI, right? It was Disabled People's International. Yes. yes. Now, um, you're correct, uh, Mary, you know, and this is one of the disappointments that I have had because I tell you, Mr. O and members of the audience, all the negotiations that were held between 2002 and 2007, Jamaica was present. It was in the latter part when we were coming to the finalization of the convention that we saw, uh, I think it was Trinidad appearing, um, and, and I think Bahamas, right? But Jamaica was the only Caribbean country that consistently participated in the uh, negotiations and I, I guess being Minister of State at the time really I, 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 I made sure that we were there at the, at the table and as Mary correctly said it won our respect in the international uh, community and since the turn of events since 2007. We have not been as strident and we have not been involved and it, it because of two reasons. Uh, on one hand, I, I was no longer the minister uh, in the ministry and uh, simultaneously, Mrs. Faith Hillerard, who was my technical support at the negotiations um, I was transferred from the ministry and then she eventually made the transition uh, from this life and so there has been a point uh, in recent times I know that the, mini the ministry to the JCPD has been attending but I don't know the extent of the impact of Jamaica on those um, uh, um, discussions. Uh, the convention requires that we uh, provide a report uh, first two years after the, 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 the convention came into force and then every four years thereafter. We were due our first report in 2010. And uh, one in 2014 and one last year. So, but I am aware that there was a draft because they had engaged the Center for Disability Studies to draft the first report. That was done and submitted to the ministry. But I can't tell you where we are in the process right now. And that there is some serious problems in terms of our commitment to uh, the convention. And that is something that the disabled community has to step up its advocacy in terms of writing to the minister, writing to the prime minister, writing to the newspapers, and making sure that you know the, 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 the ministry gives the treatment that it should be given where this uh, convention is concerned. All right, I'm not speaking on behalf of the ministry now, 
but I have to know that yes, some work is taking place. I think they're planning, they're organizing a report for I think it's July. They'll be going off to I think it's Geneva okay. to to give a response because to do to, they will submit the report and then they'll have to defend the report. So I know that those meetings have started. I have been exposed to, to that process. I think uh, towards the end of this month, they'll be doing a mock response session. And because they have, I think it's your draft, they have that they are now, um, they've been, they are being advised by the, the lawyers in terms of how to treat with some aspects of the report. Now, my worry is that this is the government's response. I would love to know if the UN is, is organizing an independent response then, a perspective from agencies serving persons with disabilities other than the government response because I have seen how they are going through and crafting the report and crafting the responses and it's it's, it's a lot of diplomacy, really. So uh, maybe you can shed some light on that for you to tell us. Well, you know, what my, what my concern is, is that I was, the Center for Disability Studies was commissioned to draft the first report. Now I understand that the ministry has presented a first and a second report to the UN. Now, I don't know who prepared That's the second. No, but, but the, the, the document should not be prepared by government officials. Oh. The document should be. The report, for objective reasons, uh, they should have but somebody outside of the ministry to prepare the report so that they capture the input of all the stakeholders, right? Um, so I am not aware of the process. They, they added stuff to the first report that I was, um, that I prepared, right? And I, I'm not aware, I'm not privy to the the content of the, 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 the current report that they, that they have. And I am not aware of the extent of the involvement of the community where the second um, report is concerned. Because, I mean, when we did the first report, extensive consultation was done among the community. Right? So that is something that the ministry has to do. Now what happens is that when they, when they submit the report to the uh, committee on the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the, the committee reviews and then sends a set of questions uh, based on the report and the country is required to respond to those uh, questions before they are accepted. And it is that process that they are going through why you would see the diplomacy and preparation taking place because it is an intense uh, uh, session and I mean, you have to be prepared to go there before clearance is given to the report. Okay, thank you very much, Mary, and I, uh, Mary for your question and Senator Marines for your response. I hope it has... Henry, Henry. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to you, Henry. I hope that shed some light 
on the matter for you, Mary, making things a little clearer. And the final question goes to Henry. Senator Morris said that research is going to, will have to be done into the whole matter of um, understanding blind science and so on. And um, could you share some kind of with, with um, um, benefit the whole um, employment of blind persons, blind individual and blind persons? You know, so, and so, so many people become blind themselves, and some of them very, very good uh, positions and so on. And then young people are coming up. Is there a sort of way in which you could touch on how you, you think it could be a lot of benefit the whole employment of persons with, um, with, with um, vision problems? Um, how would they encourage government to, if there's any way in which you could have encourage government to come to the city to the means of proposed persons? Okay. Oh, one of the first things that they will, that they will ask is how many persons are blind and visually impaired in Jamaica? And you have to be able to respond with that basic data. And then they are going to ask you, of that population, how many of them are qualified? What is, what is, what percentage of persons who are blind and visually impaired certified uh, and what to what extent is that certification what percentage of them have tertiary education versus high school education versus primary education what are their skill sets what are they able to do um, and then Research will help to show the extent to which persons who are blind and visually impaired are able to interact with their peers and motivate individuals at the workplace. So the motivational factor is a critical factor in terms of helping to market and to show employers that employing a person with a visual impairment or a person who is blind is going to help to lift staff morale and motivate uh, individuals at the workplace. But again, you have to be able to point them to research that has been conducted in that Research, 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 research. All this is saying is that proceeding going forward, research has to be the guiding light that drives outcomes, that drives results, that drives policies. And it takes us back to our starting point where we are saying that if we can really nurture our lecture series, if we can really get our own researches on the road and yearly we can make different presentations highlighting different aspects of issues having to do with blind and visually impaired persons, then it means that we would have been on the right path. We would have been on the path of contributing to national development, regional development, and international development. And my parting shot to us all is that the work continues, the trend has started, the, blade, the, the trail is being blazed, and each of us has a role to play in terms of ensuring that we prepare a way for the next generation. The, the, I remember the theme for the 60th anniversary celebration of the Jamaica Society for the Blind. And the theme says, a beacon of the past lighting the future. And this is how we need to proceed. This is how we need to go forward. And we, we should help others to understand blindness and by understanding blindness they too 
can make a difference. Thank you all for coming out. Thanks for making this evening what it is. I wish for all of you a safe journey home and refreshment. Yes, Mr. O, a new, a new, you're a tailor, right? You know? uh, Not going to make that pass. More than enough refreshment should be there. So, Mr. O'Sullivan, no complaints. Serve him the first five and let us see how well he does after that. Thanks again. Enjoy the rest of the evening. All right. That's it. Thank you for joining Senator Dr. Floyd Morris's lecture on Understanding Blindness, Making a Difference. Learned anything? Ensure you spread the word. has been a production of the JSB Library.